Good afternoon. What an incredible uh, lunch today, and uh, Ellis's uh, reminder to all of us to maintain intellectual curiosity and to continue to be uh, warriors. Uh, and we're going to be lucky today to have speak to us two women who spent the last five decades uh, being great champions of the, his, the field of women's history and women's rights generally. Uh, I'm Joe Loveland. I'm the moderator here. My principal role is to introduce these folks and then to turn it over to them, and then we'll talk again during the Q&A period. Uh, you know, we've seen amazing changes both on our campus and our society over the 54 years since many of us entered in here as freshmen. Uh, you know, at that time, the restrictions on the number of women here on campus was substantial. Women were eligible for a number of the major scholarships, such as the Moorhead Scholarship, et cetera. Uh, and, and there were other restrictions and restraints on access to programs, et cetera, during that time. All of that in the campus, I think, substantially now is gone. Uh, and we know that because you can see that the majority of the student body of the undergraduates now are women. Uh, and that in that sense, we've come a very long way. Um, today, we're going to focus though not on those experiences just at UNC, but more broadly in our society. And as I said, discussion will be primarily a discussion between Marjorie Spruill, our own class of 1973, Marjorie Spruill, and uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hall, who's been a professor in the history department here for a number of years. So let me just give you a little introduction uh, to these ladies. Um, Dr. Marjorie Spruill, our own class of 1973 classmate, is a distinguished professor emerita from the University of South Carolina. Dr. Spruill is a frequent speaker on women's suffrage nationally and abroad, as well as a media consultant and advisor for films and exhibits on suffrage and the larger subject of women's history and politics. Now, those of us who knew Marjorie here at Chapel Hill are not surprised at all by what she's accomplished during that time. She was a serious student at the time. Uh, she was a serious person involved in many of the aspects of campus life during that time. Uh, and for those of us who knew her, we can simply say she's come a long way from Washington, North Carolina roots, but there's no <laughs> surprise on how she's done it. Um, after graduation here, Marjorie earned an MAT at Duke, and then she decided she wanted to get her PhD and make a career as a professor. She earned her PhD at UVA and became a specialist in women's history. She's the author of numerous papers and books. Our subject today will really be drawn in large part from her 2017 book, Divided We Stand. Uh, it's an extraordinary history of the politics surrounding the women's movements in the United States and its impact on issues ranging from the Equal Rights Amendment to abortion restrictions, starting largely during our time in, 19, in the 1960s and 70s, and then proceeding all the way to the present time. Uh, Dr. Spruill's work here was sponsored by the Fellowships for the NEH, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, and to get a first-hand perspective on the subject that she was writing about, Marjorie interviewed Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, Gloria Steinem, Phyllis Shafley, and many others. Marjorie's most recent book, One Woman, One Vote, Rediscovering the Women's Suffrage Movement, takes the history of women and the vote up through the 2020 election. Uh, Marjorie and her husband live in Folly Beach, South Carolina. And as I said, uh, to borrow an expression from the 1970s women's movement, you've come a long way. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hall is the Julia Cherry Spruill Professor Emerita at UNC Chapel Hill. I clarified today at lunch that apparently there is not a Spruill connection per se between Dr. Marjorie Spruill and, uh, and Dr. Hall with the Julia Cherry Spruill Professorship. Um, but she is the founding director of UNC's Southern Oral History Program. Her scholarship and teaching was the forefront of the emergence of U.S. women's history in the United States. A graduate of Rhodes College, Dr. Hall earned her master's degree and her PhD at Columbia. She then moved to Atlanta in the early 1970s, working for the Southern Regional Council and helping to lead oral history projects at the Institute and getting involved in the ground floor of the women's liberation movement at that time. Dr. Hall joined the UNC faculty in 1973, so we just missed her, uh, unfortunately. And she became one of the superstars of the UNC history faculty. 
Dr. Hall is the author of numerous books and articles involving women's history and politics going back to the 1800s. Her 2019 book, Sisters and Rebels, A Struggle for the Soul of America, traces the story of the women's movement and its interaction with the civil rights movement and civil rights issues generally is seen through the eyes of three sisters uh, who took very divergent paths and had very divergent views on those issues. Uh, it's a fascinating, I thought, microcosm view of what many of the macro points that Dr. Spruill's work talks about. So it should be a fascinating opportunity for the two of them to interact on that. Um, I want to give you one perspective, because it's sort of about saying, as we know, things have changed hugely from the time we were here. Uh, but it hasn't been, as my wife Pam reminds me, a straight line progress. And it's not like things now are just on an all even ground. So let me give you an example. When we were in school in the 1970s, the Equal Rights Amendment passed the United States Senate by a vote of 84 to 8. Over 90% of the Senate voted for it. It passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 354 to 24. It was the subject of extraordinarily broad bipartisan support in both houses. Our clever country lawyer, Senator Sam Irvin, from North Carolina, though, didn't like the ERA. And he tacked on to the enabling legislation a provision that said, well, you know, it'll only be good if it's ratified within the next eight years by the appropriate number of states. Totally an invention for purposes of that provision. Um, but as you know, everybody thought that's okay. And it went through the first 30 some states almost, you know, in a matter of months. And then, it hit, started hitting a round wall, and Marjorie will explain to us many of the reasons for that. But now, as of last month, the United States Senate reconsidered whether to take away that restriction on the period of time for the amendment to be ratified. And while it passed in 1972 by voting 84 to 8, only 51 senators voted in favor of removing the restriction. 47 voted to maintain the restriction. And as in many things in our country, it was done almost exclusively on party lines. So we have come a long way. Uh, Dr. Spruill, Dr. Hall have studied that and can explain it in far greater detail. But we still have work to do. Because even today, 50 years after that amendment passed the House and the Senate, we do not have a constitutional provision granting equal rights to women, and we need that badly. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Spruill and Dr. Hall. Thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to be here today and to be in conversation with a dear and uh, longtime friend uh, a great historian. Can, can you hear? Or do, no, I, 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 oh. I think that's all. Oh. Can you hear me now? Conversation with a dear and longtime friend uh, who also happens to be a great historian. And I thought I would uh, start us off by asking Marjorie about a big claim she makes in Divided We Stand. Um, you, uh, you argue uh, that today's uh, crazy political culture, which Joe referred to, has its roots in the 1970s and in a battle between two competing groups of American women. Um, as uh, we see in this slide, uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, agreed with that claim. So I'm going to just start out by asking Marjorie how she came to what I see as a quite audacious conclusion. Thank you. And let me just say it's a 
thrilled to be here with you. It's a thrill to be here with all of you. These familiar faces. We went through so much together. We're going to talk about a lot. We're going to try to do it fast so we can get to hear from you about your experience and reactions to all these matters. And I'm honored to be here with Jacqueline Hall. As, as Joe said, we just missed her. She arrived in 73. But as I was in graduate school a few years later, and she was one of the superstars that we all looked up to, I came here to do research and, and looked you up and found you. And we have been buddies ever since. And she's been a role model for me and a whole ton of great historians out there whom she has trained. They love her to pieces. They, uh, they have done great work themselves uh, in women's history, southern history, labor history, oral history. And uh, she's just been um, a, a, such a mentor, such a beloved mentor, that the Southern Association for Women Historians has named its Mentoring Prize for her. Uh, so I just want you to know that you're in the presence of somebody really wonderful here, uh, and my friend. Um, yep, uh, that's my argument, um, and I, uh, I would, when the book came out, right after President Trump defeated Hillary Clinton in that um, momentous election, a lot of people were saying, boy, your timing is just fantastic, my God, you know, here you are, I write the book that explains how we got to this Point and, and I was thinking to myself, um, yeah, that's really nice, but I, I would, I would trade it. <laughs> any, any, I would trade it not to be wrong about all this. But anyway, um, I, it occurred to me as I was working on this book that 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 what we had here is a situation in which these two competing women's movements and the impact that it had as they competed for influence in our politics politics um, had a lot to do with how things turned out and how our current political culture is created. So basically I'm arguing is that in the 1970s that the successful reform efforts of the women's rights movement were in a way so successful um, that they were countered by the organization of conservative women organizing in opposition and as that movement grew more powerful, even within that decade, that it had huge consequences for our nation. And that these two, both mutually influential and antagonistic women's movements, led women of all political persuasions to be much more politically active than before. And yet the issues that polarized American women polarized the nation. So is, is that where the title of the book comes from? Exactly. Uh -huh. It's like, it's one of those double entendres that we scholars are so fond of. You know, it's uh, it's uh, that as, as women stood up uh, demanding more attention to women and to women's issues, uh, demanding a larger role in political decision making, that they were divided in their goals. And that the issues that divided them then divide them still, but also divide the nation. So that's it, yes. Stood up, but divided. And we stand divided now. Triple on top. Great title. Those are hard to come by. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Marjorie, another big claim you make is that the, the period when you were here in college, in the late 60s and early 70s, um, was a, a golden age for women, or at least a, a golden age for the women's movement. And um, I wondered, you know, on the surface one might think that a divided age and a golden age would be kind of a contradiction in terms. So how do you, what do you mean by a golden age? Yeah. Well, I, I want to hasten uh, to say that when I'm talking about the period of time that we were in college being a golden age, that I am speaking very specifically about for the women's 
rights cause. Uh, these were certainly not golden age in general for the nation, and I'm sure all of you remember, as Ellis just reminded us, and, and Joe again, that we were in the midst of a, a brutal, bitterly controversial war that divided the nation, contributed to a generation gap, and, and certainly roiled our campus, uh, especially during our freshman year. If you were, this will bring back uh, some memories. I mean, we arrived in August, then in October, there was the National Moratorium, which led to marches like this one that you see, in which 7,000 people are marching down Franklin Street, and I think you will recognize some of those people on the front row. The great Dan Queen, who was a mentor for me, and I know many of you, and who's that guy right over her left shoulder? Oh, yeah. Anybody? Doug Dibbert. And you talk about this not being a, a golden age. Um, I don't know how many of you know that Doug's father was killed in Vietnam. And he was, in fact, the highest ranking officer at the time to die in Vietnam. So we have Bob Goldstein also there. And then, you know, what happens right after that? December 1969, what happened then? A major consequence particularly for the men in the room? Yeah, the very first lottery. And what that meant, of course, was that, um, that there was so much criticism over the way the draft was going down that uh, they finally decided that uh, with the class issues and race issues involved that they were going to end the privilege uh, of, of student deferment and it was going to all strictly be, be done by chance. And so, you know, what you see here on this small chart over here is the results of that lottery uh, with the birth dates and the draft number, you know, with the lowest numbers, which meant that you would go right away, and the higher number meant that you probably wouldn't end up being called. But I remember, how many of you remember going downtown uh, to go to the student union to watch as they had that on television of these balls being pulled out of the, out of the lottery machine? In, in the nation's headquarters, and of course every bar on Franklin Street was, was packed. Sports boards were watching something a little different on TV than, you know, um, than on that particular night. And uh, for those of us who were uh, women, you know, who were thinking about the men in our lives, but it certainly crossed a lot of our minds to, to look at when our birthday came up and to think, you know, how different it would be for us right then. And what would we do if our name went and what decisions would we make. So anyway, these were uh, not easy times. And of course the Civil Rights Movement, which had made such major gains in the 60s, was now encountering a major backlash. Um, and Nixon was employing, beginning to employ his Southern strategy in the effort to win over alienated white Democrats in the South, uh, trying to sort of hold back federal enforcement of the busing and things like this. And, of course, we also remember Kent State, May 1970, um, which led so many students to go on strike, uh, passing the ROTC building today on the bus. You know, cannot go by there ever without thinking of going by there and, you know, with thousands of students when we were marching against uh, the war. Um, and then, of course, it was interesting that during these years, they passed another amendment to the Constitution uh, because so many people were being drafted and sent off before there were 21 in the vote. That finally, that bill that had been batted around for many years uh, went through and they lowered the voting age to 18, just in time for us to vote between McGovern and Nixon. And we all remember how that turned out. Uh, Orange County and Massachusetts were the only places in which uh, George McGovern won. Um, so that, that was definitely memorable. So these were, you know, these were, uh, these were tough years, uh, very transitional years, but not always in good ways. But in the midst of all of that, there was, things were, the times were changing drastically when it came to women and largely in a direction towards more freedom, equality, and opportunity. 
So let me kind of show them some a couple of things. Oh, yeah. about. Okay, so um, no, we'll just go back to the cover now. But okay, so the question is, you know, why did this happen at that time? How come suddenly around the time we were in college, we we're seeing all this progress? Well, to do this very quickly. Okay, so the movement had started in the early 1960s, and it had really made major progress during that decade. Uh, why? First of all, there were federal and state commissions on the status of women. I remember these. They played a very important role creating both the networks and, and setting the agenda of the modern women's movement. Can, can you, I'm going to, I think, Margaret, yeah. No, I just want to get your slides. Did you need to advance? Not, not yet. Oh, okay. Just, it was fair. It was fine. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. I have some later. Okay. <laughs> I said sorry. The, I said the wrong thing. This, um, so these federal and state commissions, super important. They didn't get nearly as much media attention as later demonstrations, but they had already made a huge difference by the time of the more um, the public demonstrations. To a large extent, these were people who were um, moderate, progressive, uh, many of them professional women, many of them lawyers, um, who were appointed to these, first to the, by John F. Kennedy, to a commission on the status of women on presidential level, and then that was followed in every state where governors appointed these commissions, and their purpose was to study the laws. And they pointed out in their reports that our society had changed very drastically, but at the same time, the laws and policies regarding women had not changed to reflect the changes in how we were actually living our lives. So in their reports, they pointed out that you know, as a result of all these social, economic, demographic changes during and after World War II, women were living longer, they were having fewer children. They were needing, even with the baby boom, it's fewer children than in the old days. And even the baby boomers were having their children at an earlier age and finishing having their children at an early age and still having these long lives, lives stretching ahead, um, increasingly uh, needing to support themselves or to augment family income, including sending their children to college because after the GI Bill, you know, it was now expected for middle class lives. I know my mother went back and took an extra job in order to get us through college. And they, at the same time, there are all these women who are needing and wanting to work and to stay in the job force and to advance in their jobs. And yet they're facing a whole set of laws and customs that were based on what used to be the case when women, most women, unless they had to because of economic necessity, stay in the homes with large numbers of children and that most of the women workers were young women who then left after they married. And so our, our customs, you know, customs such as when people call my girl or call your girl, these are date back to the days when most women workers were really young. So we have, they, so as they're wanting to stay in the job force, they're facing massive discrimination uh, in both education and employment opportunities, not to mention sexual harassment, which was rampant and common. Um, the world we've seen in that Mad Men series, I mean, this is what the world I'm talking about. Then Betty Friedan's book, 1963, that was a rip-roaring bestseller. That really got people thinking and talking. Um, so all of this leads to the creation of a major non-government organization called the National Organization for Women, founded in 1966. Uh, Betty Friedan and Pauline Murray and others, uh, many of them who had been involved with these commissions, they see the NAACP as a model for a, a powerful non-government agency that needs to get out there and promote from outside the government to try to get some of these changes made that are being recommended by all of these, all this research. 
Uh, now, also, um, their, their lawyers were very effective. They made a lot of gains. Um, they were pragmatic feminists who are pushing for change. And one of the main things they did was to get Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 so that that massively important piece of legislation on race relations also had the impact of barring gender discrimination in the workplace. Uh, they started pushing for the repeal of, of state laws against abortion, and they came out in favor of the ERA, which had been around since 1923, when first introduced by suffragist Alice Paul. Um, they saw it as a blanket bill that would quickly move to bring down all these laws, really change things. They also tried to do things outside the law to change customs and ideas about gender roles, including in the gender stereotyping of girls from infancy or even before birth, um, and making marriage more egalitarian. And finally, in the late 60s, joined by younger women, many of them coming from the civil rights movement and the anti-war movements, uh, often more radical uh, in their views, uh, women who were inspired by the strength of the women in the civil rights movement, and often alienated by the sexism of the men in the civil rights movement, as well as in the anti-war movements, if I may. Um, and they brought into the movement, a lot of times, more countercultural ideas, uh, challenging institutions from capitalism to marriage itself, uh, as well as the warrant of heterosexuality. And so, uh, by 1970, And so here we go, 1970, and there, the women's movement is now, uh, has made these accomplishments, the ground is set, and the movement is highly vocal, highly visible, with many public demonstrations, uh, as, including this amazing one that was on August 26, 1970, the 50th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. And that was just all over the country, and then support demonstrations all over the world, um, and the massive one down Fifth Avenue that just sort of put the, the whole country on notice that women were really ready for some change and that they had very widespread support, including from a lot of progressive men who wanted a new world for their wives and daughters. So you've talked about some of the wins at the national level of the civil rights movement, Title VII, for example, but are there other wins that you want to remind us of? Yes, and I'll do this quickly. The, um, so we're, all of that's from build up to 1969, 70, okay, and so then what happened in that time that we were in school? Okay, so first of all, First of all, this guy, who Bill Abso called the number one sexist male chauvinist pig in the United States, nonetheless, he's stealing the heat from women in his party, not to mention his wife and daughter, who were all supportive of the women's rights movement, um, and he um, takes all this action. He invites this young woman who gives up, a, she's got a hard MBA, she gives up um, her uh, career at Citibank to come and accept this job to kind of recruit women for leadership positions in his administration and a whole lot of Republican women that we've seen over the age ages since then came in through her. Uh, he appoints a task force on women's rights chaired by the head of the B BPW, Virginia Allen. He creates the White House Office of Women's Programs chaired by Jill Ruffles House, a leading Republican feminist. He orders affirmative action be applied to women. Um, he seeks to increase the number of women in the military. Um, and the first women generals are appointed. And then, meanwhile, the Supreme Court has all these victories for women's rights. In 1971, Reed v. Reed, 
the court strikes down an Idaho law favoring males as executors, and it bases the decision on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. That turns out to be very important because that had never been applied before. And this was all largely the work of an ACLU Women's Rights Project headed up by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it wins all these victories, heightening scrutiny for sex classifications. And the one that she first argued herself, 1973, establishing equal benefits for spouses of men and women in the military, and then on birth control. Here you have something that definitely impacted us. Um, and that is that in 72, Eisenstadt and I Mayor to legalize prescribing birth control for unmarried women. And do you realize that it was illegal up until that time for it to be prescribed for unmarried women? Uh, I don't know about here, but in South Carolina, they had the girls got together. There was one diamond engagement ring that everyone passed around when they went to the doctor in order to try to get the birth control pills. I don't remember that happening here. Some of you may remember better. Um, but also, um, this built up, you don't realize that it was only a few years earlier in which the Supreme Court had struck down laws banning contraception to married couples. Okay? And so. Well, Marjorie, let me interrupt just for one second to point out that Griswold versus Connecticut, which represented the uh, constitutional concept of, a, of privacy, a right to privacy, uh, at least two justices of the current Supreme Court question whether Griswold versus Connecticut should be, should remain law, uh, and the same privacy concept, of course, was the basis of Roe, uh, and as we know, the majority of the court struck down Roe saying the privacy concept did not reach that far, uh, and again, at least a couple of justices say we ought to be re-examining everything else based on Griswold versus Connecticut, which would include the Eisenstadt standard. So this is what we're going to get, and by the end we'll be getting to this because you know this is all, now you're convinced I'm talking about golden days here, right? Okay, uh, okay and then um, you, have, you have this famous case that came down in January '73, the same day that Linda Johnson died, and in which it said that well it's the Roe case, and so it legalized abortion. Uh, or saying that the states could not interfere during the early trimester, that they could interfere during the third trimester, and that in between, it was, you know, between a woman and her doctor. So, you know, that's what happened. And at the time, there was a strong reaction from the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, but for the most part, there was a there wasn't a hue and cry immediately that was so strong, and polls showed that most Americans believed it should be legal at some point. And then, then as far as Congress is concerned, you have more and more women are running for Congress. Now, bear in mind, there was a the dismal number of women in Congress at the time, but you are having more and more, and you're having, um, you already have Martha Griffiths, who was important in the 60s, Shirley Chisholm in the late 60s comes in and Patsy Mink, and then they're joined in 70 by Bella Abzug, and in 72, Jordan, Barbara Jordan, Elizabeth Holtzman, both who would go on to play major roles in Watergate hearings. So you have a growing number of them there. And then you have, it's a very important to note that there were women in both political parties who were feminist and very active, and it was multiracial and multi ethnic. And age it, a lot of different ages. I certainly joined it in 1971 here on campus and painted the cube in the NWPC letters. Um, so that was very important. And then you have and then you have uh, Congress as a result taking major action. And that that's the first sentence there says it all. Passed more women's rights bills than all previous sessions combined. And then 
famous Title IX, all the educational amendments of 72, and we know so much about it because of sports. That's what people talk about. You'd almost think that it was only about sports, but it was it changed higher education as well as lower education completely because what it did was it banned sex discrimination in any aspect of education from kindergarten all the way through universities and graduate programs and it, it taught, affected admissions and scholarships and curriculum and, and just really changed um, higher education. But what really symbolized all of this the most was congressional approval by overwhelming margins of the Equal Rights Amendment. As Joe mentioned, it was a stunning uh, lopsided vote and um, support came from the left and the right and you know, it was bipartisan. Um, so, no, I'm not sure, oh, how much more time, I'm really for time. No, we have, we've got oh, okay. I was just, uh, I was, I was going to ask, um, you to say a, a little bit more about why the, uh, there was so, so much bipartisan support, because I, I think that may come as a surprise to people, uh, in the current climate, um, but um, I would also venture, just from my reading of the book, that that had something to do with the fact that the uh, counter movement of conservative women was not yet on the scene. Bingo. Yes, that had a, a, a lot to do with it. In fact, uh, when have we had a period in which the two parties were as much on the same page about women's rights as they were in this period? And that is exactly, um, it's very unusual that it was like this for the first sense. Um, <clears throat> one of the most important things when it came to the ERA specifically is that it may surprise you to know that the ERA you know, had been, but that was introduced by suffragist Alice Paul in 1923, that um, the majority of the women who were the most active in the suffrage movement uh, did not approve of it until almost the period we're talking about. So there was a mass, it was a very hot and controversial issue about which the two parties were strongly divided, but it was the Republican Party that was for the ERA, and the Democratic Party that was passionately against. Now you're going, whoa, but since that reversed later on, how come? Well, the reason for that is that um, during the Progressive Era, in the early part of the 1900s, uh, business strongly did not want government regulating anything that had to do with labor relations or any other aspect of business, and, the, and so, one of the few victories that came out of the Progressive Era was protective legislation for women workers. And think that means things like maximum number of hours that you could be required to work, uh, minimum wage laws. And these were not there for men at the time. And the, you know, the, the corporations, with the support of the corporate parties, have never been wanting that. But as a result of laws that were passed during the New Deal and then in the 1960s, we now had protection for workers of both genders, okay? And so the labor movement, which had passionately opposed the ERA because they thought it would, it would make protective legislation for women unconstitutional and it would really hurt all those women workers and sweatshops and the textile industry, etc. They were being pressured by women within the labor movement in the 60s to change their position and to come out in support of the ERA. And so, so suddenly, as labor shifted on that, the Democratic Party shifted on that, and so voila, 1970, both parties are for the ERA. 
that's what explains that incredibly lopsided vote. But so there's that, and then there's exactly what you just mentioned, which is conservative women's movement did not yet exist. So uh, I definitely want to come back to that that movement, but before we do, I'm I'm really eager to. Sh uh, take a little bit of time to shift from the national level to what was going on at UNC during this time. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about um, what, act, you've already talked about the anti-war movement and uh, other things that were going on here during your uh, late 60s, early 70s, but could you talk about the atmosphere for women that you encountered when you arrived? and um, how that changed um, in your personal experience and uh, by extension, I would guess, the experience of a lot of people in this room. I think some of you may have seen this before. This was from this light blue book that was distributed on campus. That was actually, to, to be fair, from the semester right before we got here, the one on the left, this book. But at, at the time we arrived, the, a lot of administrators at UNC, including Dean Kitty Carmichael, who was in her own way a champion for women, but had a very traditional outlook. What they mainly were concerned is, as you can see here, is that we behave as ladies. And this campus code reflected in a way this kind of earlier argument for women's admission to higher education when the, it first became an issue in the late 1800s, which was that what would happen to these all-male institutions if they were violated by having women on campus, <laughs> smirched by women on campus? Uh, I mean, would, would men start behaving badly? You know, would, or maybe, the, as the advocates, of higher education for women said, uh, maybe the women would elevate, if you get the right kind of women, you know, they would elevate things and they would make the men behave better. <laughs> Remember the good old double standard, that was our job, you know, to make the men behave better. And we really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it worked in some cases. I don't think it worked out. <laughs> but, um, very quickly. Uh, that, that year, 1969 to 70, was one for the ages. And, um, uh, and things changed because of student activism and including uh, by the leadership of the Association of Women Students, the AWS, if you remember that. Uh, it was led by Joyce Davis, who was two years ago, just later an attorney in Raleigh, died suddenly a few years ago. Um, she, did, does anybody else remember this? Because I could have sworn it was true. I have told it to audiences for years, and now, and recently I haven't been able to find anybody else who remembers this. But I thought that in August of 69, that in amidst all the letters that we got from UNC, that there was one from Joyce Davis and the Association of Women's Studies that said, well, welcome, you know, people, women, freshmen, um, have you read Betty Friedan's yeah. book? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. I was not dreaming. And she just said, you know, if you live in some little town where you can't get this, here is a form that you can order it from the campus bookstore. So she she was a great right then. And then there was another group uh, that I wasn't a part of that I didn't even know about until recently doing research and seeing things that Catherine Turk, current Jacqueline's successor. Here, a great addition to our faculty um, that she found. What were you going to say? Oh, so I just was, uh, it wasn't women's studies, but the Association of Women's Students that sent out the Betty for Dan. Right? Yes, uh, and the Joyce, she, Joyce was the president of, of that, I think. And yeah, I mean, that was really, that something was kind of like, start thinking about all that you can be. Because I remember like a gym teacher that we had, uh, had us over there like learning these uh, jumping exercises and saying, you know, when you have little kids and you're directing a kindergarten skit, 
this, this sort of looks like frogs. You'll need to know this. And you need to develop your shoulder muscles because um, you're, you know, so before long you'll be going up and down stairs carrying a baby in one arm and a bag of groceries in the other. And all, and all us freshman girls were looking at each other like, where did she come from? Know, hasn't she heard? You know, the world is, is changing. Of course, later on, those, all those skills did come in handy. She had a point, but it, anyway, it didn't seem appropriate at the time. But uh, this one, Jacqueline, I don't know if you've seen this one, but this was something that uh, Catherine Turk's students turned up. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is the, the, in March of 1970. And so this is the, the, what you see on the right is my distillation of the longer one on the left. But they're looking at revision of admissions policies. Uh, they want elimination of discrimination, the granting of fellowships and scholarships. Certainly the forehead was an obvious one and it changed just a few years later after Title IX probably had a lot to say about that. Removal of quotas to limit the number of women in certain degree programs. Um, an end to steering women students away from careers in math, science, business, and law, or to convert channeling of women into traditional majors and professions. Denial of recruiting privileges to any company that discriminates against women. That sounds a lot like the anti-war movement there. End to discrimination in, against women in hiring and promoting faculty because we had so few women faculty at that time. And then in wanting more courses related to women in the curriculum. And then it wasn't, it wasn't just us, the faculty, the faculty wives, grad students and had this baby in, uh, in the in building next door here uh, in which they were demanding uh, child care on campus. Um, we also wanted an end to the hated closing hours. I think we all, that's one of the things that bugged us more than anything. Notice, notice, by the way, that Assistant Chancellor Claiborne Jones uh, in the room with a bunch of babies is smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> after, after that talk today, it's interesting. You think it was required every year on campus. Um, in, another thing that happened is that we've been uh, trying to get rid of these closing hours. Um, we were also trying to get to have members of the opposite sex be able to come in our rooms. And it, it, I found out from uh, this article that I found in going through all nine boxes um, that I did something that I did not even remember. Um, this article describes four students appointed to student, by student government president Tony Bellow uh, to make a presentation before President Friday's advisory committee. Um, I had no memory of this, but I was apparently one of them. Um, and I certainly do remember being a student representative on a Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Minority and Disadvantaged Students. And that we talked about uh, race relations and the need for more minority students and minority faculty. Um, but I also pointed out that this new administrator was going to need to do something about other disadvantaged students, i.e. women, uh, and to try that women were, as I was learning in my sociology classes, a minority group because of our lowly status, and that they were going to have to do something about that, uh, and that the person that we were trying to get them to hire as a new administrator was going to have to work on not only racial but gender injustice, and I believe that that did happen shortly later. Um, and then there was a the whole matter of changing laws and campus policies and social mores regarding sexuality. That was a very drastic and memorable part of the time that we were there. They had, right before us, the policy was that a, a, a pregnant student who was unmarried had to leave, that they wouldn't accept any who were. Uh, 
they were known as applicants to be pregnant and unmarried, they would be rejected. That if uh, any uh, administrator found out that someone who was having an illegal pregnancy had a, was pregnant and had an illegal abortion, that they had to be turned in for possible disciplinary action. And so uh, you can see that those things that were changing in the federal level would have a really big impact um, on us. Um, this booklet, Elephants and Bubbles, you have them. your copy? <laughs> <laughs> then all of you will remember how the Griswold decision had a big impact that our own Dr. Taki Christ, uh, OBGYN yes. at the yes. infirmary, so many of you probably had your first exam and your first birth control pills from him. You don't know if somebody has to raise their hand. Um, <laughs> and he was on a crusade to educate students about sexuality, to prevent unwanted pregnancies. And he and students, including um, Margaret Scales, remember, who was involved in this, put out this book. And those of us who were involved in freshman camp as counselors, you remember how every year we would invite him to come out and speak to the new students, the freshmen, and toward the end, mischievously, we would situate ourselves on, on the railings around so we could see their faces when he told them things like, I know a lot of you don't think that this applies to you, but let me try to give you some statistics on the percentages of students who arrive on campus virgins and the ones that graduate as virgins. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, you're going to need this. So, so these were uh, changing times. And then as far as the curriculum is concerned, it was just starting. Um, now had urged creation of courses about women in the curriculum nationwide, and these were starting to pop out here and there. Uh, but there were not many women faculty, and there were few people few men who were interested in or knowledgeable enough to teach it. And so Peter Belaine stepped up working with two women graduate students, Dorothy Gay and Sarah Evans. And um, I took that course and was rightly inspired by that. And then the last thing to say about that is that though we didn't have many faculty members who were women, those, I'm sure this one made a huge impression on us. Uh, Joy Casson, who directed my, uh, my honors thesis about women's suffrage. Dorothy, Dor Doris Betts was really inspiring as a, a woman who, at a personal level, had such spirit and gusto and confidence. And she wrote this on the right, um, that I was one of the best arguments for why male chauvinism is doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I love this last slide, but uh, Marjorie, you left out uh, one of the slides that I particularly wanted, and I wondered where that slide might be. Okay. <laughs> Jacqueline was twisted my arm on something. Okay, this, is, this thing is slow, but I, so I'm going to have to flip through to the end to get to it. Never miss the slides. <laughs> 
give it very short, very soon. Just as a faculty member, a faculty perspective. Um, so I, this was so interesting to me to think about. Um, and I, I loved reading Marjorie's book because it, it put my own experiences in, in context too. But um, so, so I came here in the fall of 73, right after you all left. And um, I would say that the point about the, the um, advances that women were making in the early the first half of the 70s held true for, for the faculty also. And partly with this, and definitely with the support of the, the women students. Um, but it happened later. So there was definitely a lag. I this is my feeling, my intuition, is that it was a lot easier for the men on the faculty to welcome uh, smart, uh, cute young women than it was for them to have uh, colleagues who were their equals and who they had to uh, treat in a way that they hadn't really been brought up to uh, treat and think about women. Um, so in this, I came in, as I said, I came in 73, and uh, this is just one example of both the progress and the, and the difficulty. Uh, in 74, as a result of all of these things that uh, Marjorie's been talking about, pressure from within the university, but also pressure from the federal government for affirmative action, for an end to discrimination, and so on, the chancellor uh, instituted a policy of affirmative action in the sense of telling the departments that if they were able to find and hire qualified uh, female or minority, candidates that he would give them a line. Any of you who are faculty members know that getting a line is a really big thing and hard to do. So they jumped at the opportunity, but as somebody at the time put it, the departments outfoxed the chancellor and they ended up either hiring people that they knew were going to fail with the belief that, that with the idea that uh, five years later they could let them go, they could still have the line, and they could hire a well-qualified white man. Uh, others uh, hired highly qualified people, but uh, there was a, a, a chilly climate was in the, uh, the phrase of the time. They, made, they didn't give those newcomers, those new faces, the kind of support uh, or welcome that they needed. And when this, uh, what came to be referred to as the class of 74, came up for tenure uh, five years later, and this is when I was coming up for tenure too, in 78, 79, um, a whole lot of those uh, women were let go. Uh, so the upshot of that was that by the late 70s, when um, by then a majority of the student body was made up of women, but the number of women on the faculty had not gone up since 1974. It had gone, that there had been this little bump and then, you know, back down. Um, so those were, were interesting times for the faculty as well. I, I have to show you one I slipped in here without asking Jacqueline. Oh, <laughs> this is a honey shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you at least it could be. You <laughs> looks so great. But uh, would you tell them about the Well, this is my major. This um, is something I wanted you to see. This is Jacqueline right at that time. And this refers to something, a major contribution she's made here in the Southern World History Project about women and feminism and anti-feminism. Yeah, the Southern World History Program. So it's still going uh, strong today. 50, we're about to have our 50th 
50th anniversary. Uh, but I, I do love this photograph because I'm, I'm interviewing um, Guy and Guy and Johnson, who were uh, now, for, or who are in many ways forgotten now, but who were major figures in sociology and in the sociology of here in, in sociology, Gamayan was a, a distinguished historian and she was hired during World War II to teach when the men were off to war and they needed, needed somebody to teach them and they let her go. So there was never any thought that they would, you know, that Diane would be on the faculty. Uh, and partly that is because Guy was on the faculty and um, the rules, that one of the big barriers to women at the time were the rules that said that if your husband was on the faculty, you couldn't be on the faculty. So that uh, really uh, cut out any women who ended up being part of the, the uh, faculty women's organization. These were women who, many of whom you know, could have been doing other things and were doing other things besides being faculty wives. So, um, let me, uh, oh, we've yeah. got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, um, and then I want, in order to release some time for questions. So, uh, that's, that's perfect. So, um, so let's get to um, what this is some, it, as I said earlier, uh, Marjorie's book uh, helped me think about the things that I was personally experiencing, but what it really did most importantly is that it really drove home to me something that I just was not aware of at the time, which was that, you know, at the very same time that, you know, I, we were involved in these uh, struggles here, and a new women's movement was arising, a counter-conservative uh, women's movement. So you want to, in the last period that we talk, have to talk about that and, and touch on, uh, especially the, the uh, Houston Conference, which I think uh, uh, Gloria Steinem said was the most important gathering that nobody's ever heard of. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what she said. And, um, yeah, so this, we can take this time to go from where we just described um, to where we are now. And as Jacqueline said, um, you know, this right term wasn't necessarily inevitable, you know. Uh, and we, at the time, sure as heck, didn't see it coming. Um, and I argue in the book that it came as a result of rather strenuous effort by people with women playing the leading role, people who were unhappy and distressed by what they were seeing, um, it was, there was already a backlash against the progress of the civil rights movement, but this is now a major backlash against the major accomplishments of the women's movement. Um, and in some instances, as I just got into this, as time passed by the late 70s, it's really meshing with the um, protest against the civil rights gains. So you will end up seeing that, that the feminist movement and the civil rights movement will have a whole lot of the same enemies. Um, so as, as I, I was inspired by Sarah Evans, who was one of the TAs for that class at your talk, and went on to be a great pioneer figure in writing women's history. And her book was Personal Politics, The Origins of the Civil of the Women's Liberation Movement in the Civil Rights Movement and the Anti-War Movement, something to their effect. And she was basically describing something she had gone through. And it was a very good example of how you can write history about things that you were involved in. Um, Don and Jane Matthews went on to write about the ER, a wonderful book about the ERN fight in North Carolina. And that one inspired me to believe that one can write about things that you're opposed to. And I was also inspired by the uh, work of Dr. Peck. Do you remember Dr. William Peck, Bill Peck, whose courses about religion we used to line up and fight to get into because they were so popular. 
And one of the things he said that always stuck with me is, he said, I'm going to teach you about religions of the world. And so you're going to be studying about each one. And as we go to each one, I'm going to try to get you almost to the point of conversion. He said, the only way you can ever understand it is if you understand it so well that you can see why people believe this. And that always stuck me, so I thought, okay, that's a tough order in this case, but I'm going to give it a try. So I was really trying, though trying, not ever trying to hide my own um, identity with the women's rights movement, which I would never do. Um, I still wanted to understand why these women thought what they thought, when they thought it, and why they acted, took the steps that they did. Um, so what I found was that the, there were a lot of conservative women who watched these women's commissions and all in the 60s, uh, watched those games the women's movement was making, and were really unhappy with it, and then saw even Nixon, who they thought was one of them, uh, point, do, take the steps he took. But they were grumbling, kind of quietly grumbling. They weren't organizing. And so Nixon and all these Republican men, some of them hated feminism, nonetheless were supporting it, or at least you know, supporting equality um, for women. Then, and the ERA had been on the GOP platform for 40 years. Uh, Eisenhower, others had supported it. Okay. Um, but so it, this, they did not organize in the way at all or in the way they did it except for the Phyllis Schlafly. In 1972, just as the ERA was about to come out of Congress, um, she was encouraged by a lot of other conservative women to study up on this issue. She hadn't cared anything about it. She was very busy. Uh, with studying nuclear issues and national defense and, and passionately writing about how we had to stand up to the Soviets in terms of our national military strength, all this. And she was, she saw it as, it, as she put it, the ERA was innocuous, if not mildly useful. And only she had stayed there. But uh, she turned out to be just an incredibly uh, able leader that we totally underestimated, and she seemed to just she seemed to just come out of nowhere. She was she she wrote this book. Some of you may have heard of that. <coughs> it was it helped to persuade the Republican Party to nominate Eric Goldwater. She was part of that. Well, when his, he lost so drastically, she was really out of favor with the, with the people who were in control of the GOP, Rockefeller, Romney, and um, others. And uh, they hated her, she hated them. And so she was way out of favor, but she had a major base of followers, and she had a network of addresses and she had a newsletter that she sent out once a month. So she had a ready way to communicate with people. Uh, she was a conservative Catholic. She was, as I said, on the GOP's right wing, uh, out of favor in her party, but extremely skilled at building coalitions, including with like-minded people, not of her faith or of her party. She ended up working very closely with, as Joe said, Senator Sam Irvin, who was the leader of the opposition to the ERA while it was going through the Congress. But he also teamed up with Schlafly almost immediately to do everything they could to stop its ratification. He, of course, was a wily old so-and-so who had been putting the brakes on federal progress on civil rights for years and had mastered the art. And he made them do that seven-year deadline, I'm convinced, because he knew that if they just had that, they could stop it. And he called on all of his buddies in the state senate and all over the country said, you send this to 
you table this, we'll, we'll build up. So they worked together closely. Clapton also worked um, closely with Helms later on. Um, relig and religion was super important. She teamed up with Mormons and Orthodox Jews. She went out to Salt Lake City, said, I need your help on this. They gave it in big time. She also uh, reached out to Protestant women who were organizing uh, separately already under Lottie Beth Hobbs of the Church of Christ. Uh, this woman turned out to be extremely important. She um, was able to get large numbers of evangelical Protestant women to, um, to believe that this was ERA thing was going to ruin their lives, that it was also going to totally mess up their churches, that it was going to set, uh, substitute feminist laws for those of God's laws, and that it was going to impose a, a level of sameness on the sexes that they didn't want, that it was going to lead to abortion and homosexuality. And she and Schlafly reached out and recruited her. And, and so that whole coalition, uh, largely united by a belief in traditional uh, patriarchy at home as well as in the church and in the nation, joined together and they were able to stop that ERA bandwagon. As Joe said, by 1975, they had stopped the ERA uh, four states short of what were needed for ratification. Um, and the ERA uh, proponents would fight like heck for and to even get an extension to 1982, but were never able to get more than one more state, and that's when Rosalind, <coughs> Rosalind Carter called Birch people in Indiana and, and persuaded them um, to vote for it. So, so at any rate, they had stopped the ERA pretty much by 75. But then, in the following, uh, at that time, Schlafly is thinking, okay, we're, we've won, we're done. But then this, this came, and this is what Jack was referring to, this, this conference that most people uh, have heard very little about, and that is the International Women's Year conferences. Um, I missed them myself. I was in my first semester of grad school, it was a huge national sensation of media, extravaganza, and I totally had my nose in the books and missed it. Uh, but what happened is that the UN had declared that this was going to be the decade for women. They had a major conference in Mexico City where they had a national uh, plan, uh, world plan of action. Feminists like Abzug and Mink and others who had been there said, we need one in the United States. We want to have them in every state so that we can come up with our national plan of action to guide Congress and the President, and we want to have these meetings in every state. Um, and so Congress passed a bill approving this, uh, $5 million funding, and these were going to be held in every state, and they were all directed by a commission that Gerald Ford had appointed and then later Carter added to all feminists, no Schlafly. And so she had a fit and said, this is federal funding of one side of a national debate. And of course, she had a point. But at that time, we were all saying, well, you don't have a meeting on civil rights and invite the Klan. <laughs> you know, so it, this was the way we looked at it then. And, and, and they, in her point of view, she's technically, she's right. We, our point of view needs to be what we were respecting that point of view, but neither did all the leaders of the, of the Republican Party in the early part of the, this decade. Um, so it was, you know, it's a major change in thinking. So um, what happens is there were these meetings in every state and where these issues were debated and you would elect delegates to go on to a national um, convention. Everybody would make like these conventions and then And then they all go on to Houston, Texas. Um, the lesbian rights issue becomes very important. Uh, there were uh, people who were saying that on the list of international plan, we, we need to stick up 
uh, lesbian rights and against uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual preference. And even Betty Friedan, who had believed the women's movement shouldn't touch that issue, it was too dangerous for the women's movement, she came around and supported it. And lots and lots of straight women at these meetings all over the country uh, supported the lesbians because Anita Bryant in 1977 was having that major homophobic Save Our Children movement that was trying to create a very negative picture of, of gays and led to a lot of violence against them. So anyway, it was also a case in which Use the mic, though. 
A lot of the gains that were made um, have not been overturned and never will be uh, because women from both sides have gained from that and, and we can barely even imagine the world that, that we had before this. But at the same time, there is one that, that obviously is very much endangered and that is reproductive freedom. And it's, that seems to be one of the things that, that just riles people on both sides more than anything. And one of my arguments in the book is that um, the more that these issues, gender issues, issues that are loaded with moral and religious significance came to the forefront of national politics, the more difficult it came to have any kind of compromise because each side saw it as immoral to compromise. And the leaders couldn't compromise because their followers on both sides won't accept compromise. And then, of course, moderation goes out the window. So those two ideals really change. And then when you have the two parties take opposite sides, then they, they dig in and we get the kind of gridlock that we have. So it's been very, very hard. But what's going to happen now, I'm not sure. It's the, the, the feminist optimist in me says that the, as my husband's constantly saying, that you go to be just, it was, it's like the dog that caught the the truck. Well, now they, they have it and they're paying some consequences and uh, will they, will, will, if people stand up and, as I believe they will and fight for the right to have their birth control and abortion legal, um, if, if people stand up in big enough numbers, then I think they don't have to back away from that. And that's the most hopeful thing that I can uh, think of and come up with it, uh, what we need is, is a situation in which we extend, make birth control much more available. The Biden administration yesterday or the day before, the, the FDA is now saying to make this over the counter. Um, and if, we, if this continues to be the case also with the, with the um, drugs for the lithoprose, I can never pronounce it right, um, then, then these kinds of things could be mitigated by that, but it's, it's all going to be settled at the ballot box, and we're just going to be finding out how much do Americans care about women's health and about uh, women's rights to control their bodies, and how much do women care. Really focus on state legislatures, uh, yeah. because that's where the battles are being fought after the Supreme Court's decision. It's all going to be in the state legislatures. Uh, what happens today if a woman gets pregnant? I would say in response, that you, that's a super legitimate concern, but look at Wisconsin uh, as a place where there's change. It can be done. I mean, in North Carolina, last year the legislature said that the political gerrymandering was unconstitutional, and then there was an election. One justice of the Supreme Court in North Carolina flipped, and now the Supreme Court of North Carolina said, oh no, that decision is wrong. So it's all going to be still determined by states, swing states, and how they do it. We're, we're uh, got time for one more question. I like your grandmother question. What can grandmothers do? Your best advice for what we can do. Because we remember when it was like before all this. And then too, I mean, yeah.
we need to, to um, raise strong children, and we need to be strong ourselves. And uh, we, we need to be politically involved. We need to teach people not to stand back and be apathetic, to show up on every election. You can, you can uh, get, you can fight against this book banning crap, and uh, buy real, and buy yourselves, buy really good books that have strong women role models and men, and strong and, and good, decent men being portrayed, being doing the right thing in books, and get these, give, donate them to the schools. I mean, there's a million things you can do. Um, but that's all we have time for. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have a round of applause for you.